Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. It is raining its ass off outside. Well, um, you know, I'd rather have that than the uh, the next six inches we're going to get <laughs> by tomorrow this time. Yes. I'm uh, done with this. Oh, I'm uh, Done. Yeah, we haven't even really had uh, the crazy storms, but it's just, it's all been nasty. No, I mean, granted, we're not Boston. Mm-mm. You know, they are they are just Ten past, feet? Yeah, they're passing nine feet already, yeah, I think. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's, we are not that, but I'm done with it still. Yeah, exactly. I am. I am. So, uh, as usual, we want to start off thanking the fans. Thank you, fans. Yes, thank you, guys. Uh, doing the whole uh, Amazon banner, clicking through mm-hmm. on our webpage, ampsandaccesscast.com. Yes. Uh, the donate button, the PayPal donate button. Everybody that's donated, thank you so much. Um, you know, follow us on the Twitter, the Instagram. That's a big one. The Instagram, right? And, and Facebook. It's all there on our front page. You can click on those little icons. Takes you right out. You it's don't awesome. have to be figuring out what we do. Technology. It's a wonderful. It's thing. a it's a great thing. It is. And uh, you know, we uh, we appreciate everything because it keeps the lights on. That's right. And and <laughs> keeps us motivated to, <laughs> sure to keep does. you happy. <laughs> and so we we're picking keeps up Keeps us happy too. We, we, and your comments. Your comments are doing uh, doing us a great favor. We're actually now if you go out and you type in the word amp in iTunes, we're like number 7. Oh, that's great. We're rising that, up as time goes through. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Yeah, yeah. it says Amps and Access and Podcast. Uh, I don't know if I've gotten to everybody. I don't, I don't know, but I mean, I, I try whenever possible to... The Facebook. The Facebook yeah. comments. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, man. They've all been mm-hmm. really good, really positive. Oh, yeah. uh, could, some questions hopefully I've answered and, you know, so... And, and you know, we, uh, we'll we we'll just keep you know, plugging I mean, it I'll, away, I'll man. Like P, some, somebody will sneak me PMs in on my... Friday page or something, you know. But I, I you know, I, I do what I can. Hopefully, it's yeah. it's enough, and maybe someday we'll get enough of it that I can that we can do hire something some, with it on the show. Maybe well, we can hire somebody. No, well, we can we can turn it to some you know, a topic or something on the yeah. show, or you know, there. Well, one day at, at some point, there's going to be a whole other show. Yes, and one day I would love to. Uh, we we have to work on this, but we can take calls. You know, we'll, we can mm-hmm. we can put it out there. Tell them tell everybody where we're getting ready to record. And we can take a call thing, and and you know people can call in and ask us questions. You know so, that's what I'm. That's what the next the next step is. So would we be. be able to like put them on hold, and they would actually hear us recording the show live? Yeah. So one of those wow. things we got to get set up for that, and that's, that's going to take that's going to take a little bit of time. But it is. Um, uh, you know, as far as everything else, I mean, you guys are really digging the show, and that and that's that's the number one thing. Big time, man. Yeah. Great comments. Great yeah. comments. So thank you. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, you know. So. Uh, one thing is that we always do. We always start off with a little thing. I once again will plug another podcast, and it's Eddie, Mister Eddie Trunk. Okay. Now I want to give you a little trivia, and I haven't discussed any of this with you, so there's no smoke and mirrors here, people. Wow. Okay. So the trivia you're going to highlight the brain dead that is me. <laughs> well, I'll be surprised if you get it right, but okay. Uh, oh, good I, a challenge. A lot of people don't, so I'm going to put it out there. Can you name the guitar players from the current guy? To the guy that was at the beginning that Ozzy Osbourne, as a solo artist, had as a guitar player. So go well, ahead and go ahead and shoot him off there. Solo artist. Yeah. So when he left Black Sabbath, got an Ozzy, mm-hmm. he became, you know, Ozzy Osbourne band. Can you name all the guitar players that that have been in the band? Well, was since... was Zach with him as solo as a solo yeah, yeah. artist? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So Zach. Um, 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 was Jake also, or was Jake? Absolutely. Okay, okay yep, Jake. Yep, that's two. Okay, Jakey Lee. You're, you're um, forgetting the big one. Uh, well, I'm forgetting the big one. Little guy, plays Les Pauls. The first guy? 
Died in a plane crash? He was with him when he... Oh, that's right. When he was solo. I'm, I keep thinking he was... For some reason, I keep thinking he was in Black Sabbath. <laughs> no, no, Randy, Randy Rhodes. Randy of course. Rhodes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rhodes. Yeah. There um, and there's, there's actually two more. Now, the newest one, you may get, you may not. And it's understandable. Bumblefoot? No. No. Gus G. Okay. Okay. So Gus G is a black star. But now, the guy that you won't even know... Okay. ...is... A guy named Joe Holmes. Joe Holmes was was with Ozzy for like five years, but really? never recorded an album with him. Never rec no, no recordings whatsoever. Wow, just live performance. Uh, live performance. He did some tracks, but he never he got like co-writing stuff, but he never really recorded with him. He was in between when Zach did Pride and Glory. And then he did some black label stuff and then he came back and, and in that period of time when he was gone, when Zach was gone, this guy named Joel home, Joe Holmes took his position and oddly enough, he was a strat player, sort of like Jake, mm -hmm. um, but an insane guitar player. And, uh, well, Eddie trunk interviewed him this week. Okay, now this is the week of, uh, what are we, the fourth. It's the fourth today. Correct. Okay, we, we don't have to, you know, right. pull back anything on our listeners. But so uh, the the episode is from uh, last week, last, last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's March 4th. Now, as we record, it would be the Thursday before. So Joe Holmes was the interview. He has a band called Pharmacos. <laughs> right? Okay. It's a weird name. But it's F A R M I K O S. Their album actually releases on March the fifth. So tomorrow, our time, it will be released. This album is insane. Really? Oh God, this is a this is not a shredder album. This guy's not a shredder either. He's a very good guitar player. He's got that Randy Rhodes kind of style to him. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like Alice in Chains meets uh you know like a, like an Aussie type thing. It's it's very unique in their sound. Uh, you can hear the blend of their influences, obviously. Um, but the thing about this guy that was very intriguing during the interview, he's 51 years old. He actually did a tour with David Lee Roth as the DLR band, hmm. right? And he did that for like a year, I think. So he had these two big gigs that he did, you know, the Aussie gig and this, and this David, David Lee Roth, Lee Roth. gig. Yeah. He actually, I think he said in there, he actually stopped playing guitar for a couple years where he didn't do anything. Sort of like Jakey e. Lee. Just didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. I think he had a kid. He had a daughter. Yes. He had a kid. So he wanted to make sure that during those first years he was there. Right. 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 And, and good on you. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he obviously is very smart with his money because he had money, mm -hmm. you know, to do this. To be able to do that. Yeah. Right. And, uh, but the cool part is if you go out to YouTube and you type in Joe Holmes... You'll see videos, but you're going to see Pharmacos videos where he's in the studio recording. And the guy that he records with um, pulls out the two-inch tape for him. <laughs> they use Pro Tools, but they go to two-inch tape. This guy is like a real traditionalist. He's got like a 70 Strat, the big head stock Strat. Mm -hmm. Paint is gone. Uh, <laughs> like, he only uses Strats. They all have a humbucker with two single coils. Um maple necks you know maple fingerboards mm -hmm. but uh just you know old uh, these are old school strats these are the real deal and he said uh yeah my rig is the same marshall that i bought when i was 17 years old wow. and he says i still use that same rig he goes that that's my favorite rig that's the one i use now he's 51 years old so he bought it when he was 17 that's uh in my math that's 34 years ago <laughs> let me let me back up in there. So thirty four. So that's uh, uh, the, seventy one, right? Is it eighty one? No, that's 81. 81. 81. Yeah. So I don't know what it is. He didn't get in. See, that's mm -hmm. where Eddie Eddie needs like yeah. we need to do the second interview with Joe so we can find out what he's got. <laughs> right. Because eighty one, it could be anything. It could be. It could anything. be anything. Yeah. You but know? um, yeah, he he's one of these guys that got what he liked. Mm -hmm. That's it. He stuck it. He that's what he uses. Right. He right. uses uh, big headstock strats and marshals, and you know, well, that, you know, pedals. that's like the uh, that that link I sent you the other day for uh, uh, Ingve. Oh, yeah. You know, it, same same thing. And Found what he liked, 
and used it forever. And when I and the interview was basically, or I'm sorry, the thing was basically a selling thing that you sent me. It was yes, that was that my, was that was one of them. There yeah. were two. I didn't send you the second one. Yeah, but. here's my tuner. The Ingve Malmsteen tuner. Ingve Malmsteen. Here, uh, Malmsteen. It's Ingve Malmsteen. <laughs> and the pedal. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but the case, the the, the gig the, bag, the gig bag, and the yes. strap, and the strap, know. yes. Right, right. But just like him, and and this was what was my my comment to you was, you gotta love that guy. Yeah. He has never deviated. He's got vibrato that just is insane. Yeah, there was a, a second Rebecca Dirks. Uh, um, rig rundown yeah. that I didn't send you uh -huh. that he's showing her like the the 15 well, or 18 yeah, Marshall I've seen that. heads that are uh, yeah yes it's, I've it's seen great. that and he goes there's two things that can be seen from space right the wall of, <laughs> China, wall of China and these Marshalls and the, and the wall of Ingve yeah <laughs> Ingve but, Malmsteen but you, you exactly <laughs> but what you gotta love about that guy is his integrity he's never deviated from Marshalls mm -hmm. and Strats I mean, you know, personally, I, I, I suffer note overload in about five minutes yeah, with, I mean, with that. It's but a, I, you it's know, a very he, What he does, taste. he does better than anybody, in well, my, my and, opinion. And he pretty much, that he the reason he's still here and the reason that he's still being able to do it is because he pretty much introduced it. Mm -hmm. You know, he was the to, guy. To the general public, yeah. Yeah, he was the neoclassical guy that started it all mm -hmm. with that side. Um, but Joe is one of those guys. And he said, we, we use Pro Tools, but we go to two-inch tape. And I was like, oh, we I, we got to have this guy yeah, on the phone. we got to get him on. we got to get him on because he does this traditional style of recording using the modern interface. I don't know how they do it. I want to know how they do it. Yeah. And then he, uh, you know, he uses all this old gear and just that's that's where he's in well, the driver's seat. Maybe we can get him and his producer on. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. But yeah. it wouldn't and wouldn't an incredible guy, very humble, mm -hmm. very thankful for everything that he's ever had. He said it was the best things for me to do that tour with Roth and then to play with Ozzy Osbourne for for literally like 5 years. That's that's killer, you know. <laughs> and and I don't feel bad about not knowing his name. What I do I I'm sitting here feeling like a doofus because for my my brain Oh, you went to Black Sabbath for Randy Rhodes. It, 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 yeah, and it, my brain doesn't separate <laughs> Sabbath from Ozzy, you know, and it's like, it's, I mean, Sabbath, Sabbath, you know, it's understandable. It will always be Iomi, you know, absolutely. It, no question about it, you know, yeah. but my brain just my brain just looks at Ozzy's career and but, I don't have I don't have a, a hard dividing line in my brain where, where you know, well, Sabbath stops is, but, and, and then it just they they kind of come and go. Well, the other thing <laughs> is, too, is that if you really think about it, Zach Wilde had the longest tenure in Ozzy Osbourne, not Randy Rhodes. True. Oh, yeah, true. Randy Rhodes was only in there for probably five years, tops. Yeah. Tops. Yeah. He They did two albums. He died after the, after the second he, album. He died right? in 83. The first album came out in, what, 81? So... Yeah, it's. W were they touring the second album at that point, or had they it, were on tour for the second? Yeah, yeah when he yeah. when the plane right. when he crashed the plane. So yeah, it's totally understandable that you, sometimes you can draw a blank on Randy Rhodes being that first guy, even though the hits came from Randy Rhodes. Zach Wild, he took over. It was, it was Zach Wild. I mean, mm -hmm. you could dissociate Ozzy Osbourne's solo career with Zach Wild more than any other player. Yeah, I mean, he was on, and we, and we already had this discussion one time before. It's like, who wants to try to fill those shoes? And you know, the it's thing like, was, Jakey Lee had a very tough time with it, mm -hmm. and you know, there was some un nasty doings with the whole recording thing and not paying I, him. Well, and giving but him I mean, but I mean, you know, uh, Zach trying to fill. Um, oh yeah, uh, Randy's shoes. Oh. Like that's you. Re you want to try that? Yeah, you because know, he was so unique. Oh yeah, yeah. Randy yeah. was so unique. Yes. You know? uh, Zach does. He does an incredible job, mm -hmm. you know. There's also been talk. It's so funny. We always go back to Zach Wall, but one of the things about Zach is that there's always, there's been a lot of talk about a Pantera reunion, and Zach, because he was like best friends with Dimebag Daryl, taking that spot. But Vinny said that's a part of our lives that's over. That was my brother, you know. Mm -hmm. That that was that guitar player for that band, and he said that will not happen. And he has wow. hell yeah. Um, this is Vinny Paul, right, right. his brother. He they actually had, just came through. Yes, Baltimore and, last night. I think it was last night. And you know who we have to get is the one guitar player, and I forget his name. I think it's Tom, who used to be in Nothing Face. 
and we oh, could talk yeah. to Drew, and I know he can make that happen. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a he's a Dean endorser. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's that whole Ty thing, and, you know, the whole Dean thing goes back to Zach mm-hmm. with Leslie when you were in Chicago that time. It's so weird how many degrees of right, this happens, right, right. you know? When, yeah, when they did the video, the, the 12 fret. Right. Video. I think we, I can't remember whether we hooked up in, in LA or Nashville at, at one of the amp shows, but, you know, That's, it was the, whole, it was the yeah. Dean, Leslie, yep. you know, Buddha thing. And um, you, I, should, I should try to get Dean on. Dean, Dean's got a, a new cool. Guitar yeah, DBZ. Yeah, DBZ. It's yep. like it's really paper thin. Yeah, it's really. Th- <laughs> I should. I should. I should get in touch with Dean. It'd be get interesting. Yeah, yeah, because he's. Uh, I think his line is mostly Korean um, now, mm-hmm. uh, because he took a pretty big hit the second time. <laughs> he's taken some hits in yeah, his career. He has. There was a time when he wasn't building guitars, and there was a link there, and you know. But, oh yeah. And once again, we deviate off, which is good. It's That's, okay. Yeah, you know. But yes, uh, so there's a lot you, that goes on in the if music If you can world. check out the Eddie Trunk podcast and check out the Joe Holmes interview, I think a lot of people will be really surprised that there's this unsung guitar hero that was an Aussie. Yeah. That did five years, literally almost virtually unknown. Well, I'm going to go look him up. Yeah. I am. And what sure. an amazing guitar player. When you see those YouTube videos for the Pharmacos thing, you will be you'll be very impressed. Wow! Yeah, the dude has got he chokes notes just right. Mm-hmm. And cool. speaking, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing his style. Yes. Yeah, so, well, after we finish here, we'll yeah. I'll show you a video. Now, speaking of guys who can choke a note to death, <laughs> that yeah. would be well, our our guest yes. for the week. Yeah, he um. He he's been doing a little uh, little guitar slaying for quite a while now. Um, not uh, not afraid of the Les Paul. No, no, but uh, no, not at all. And I'm sure he has a few, and and we'll find out. <laughs> yes, he um, does. You know, he he also uh, is at, easily at ease with a Strat. You know, he he can do yeah. he, he can move around a Strat neck just like a Les Paul. Makes the Strat talk, you know, just the way he wants to. He's one of those guys. Because I, I, I watched a bunch of videos, mm-hmm. right? And uh, he's one of those guys that it's like, hey, here's my uh, fill in the blank, uh, you know, four hundred dollar Korean made whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want to get up and play with us? Sure thing. And uh, you'll be like, so it's not the guitar. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> For sh- well, <laughs> yes. Everybody who knows anything about something in this industry eventually figures out that <laughs> the guitars are nice, the amps are nice. <laughs> it's the hands that it, are great, but it's the hands that are great. Yeah, <laughs> and this this guy's got a great set of hands, man. He's yeah. he's been uh, he's been making notes come out of them for a long, long time now. Oh, yeah. And uh, I I saw I saw the band. Oh my god, um, probably probably close to 15 years ago now in Nashville uh, when we were there for a, a NAMM show. And uh, they just had the whole place whole place on their feet, man. I'm sure. Yeah, it was really yeah. good. So we, um, we're we going to take a quick break, and then we will be back with uh, founding member and guitarist of the Kentucky Headhunters, Mr. Greg Martin. Hi, this is Bruce Bouillet guitar player from Racer X, The Scream, Epidemic, countless other bands, including my own solo stuff here. Uh, And you're listening to Amps and Axes. All right, and we're back. And without further ado, um, father of the Kentucky Headhunters, or at least one of the main dads of the Kentucky Headhunters, uh, Mr. Greg Martin. Greg, how are you? Not bad for an older fellow. I'm hanging in there. you know, getting older is uh, inconvenient, and it's quite a career getting older. You know, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> reinvent yourself daily. And, yes. and see, that's a good. You have the freedom to do that. You know, you can just thumb your nose at everybody and go, "I'm old. I'm reinventing myself." <laughs> <laughs> right, man. Every every day, I'm. So, I look in the mirror and go, "Hey, Dad. I mean, who's that?" <laughs> Somebody said, "Hey, man. I'm watching some ghost." Uh, some paranormal stuff on TV. I said, I see that every morning when I get up. I go scare myself to death. But anyway, how are we doing up there? I'm speaking to uh, Jerry, correct? Jeff. Yeah. Jeff. Sorry. Yeah, sorry that's about right. That. Jeff and Mick. 
my co-host yep, Mick. and Mick. Yeah, All right, guys. How you doing? <laughs> Man, I'm doing pretty darn good, actually. That's just good. Just, uh, and you're riding the storm out, you know, down here like yeah, you man. guys are. Well, I got I got to say one thing. Okay. And, like I always do. <laughs> you only uh, get one thing. So I only quick. get one <laughs> thing. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've had the pleasure to see some of the videos, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, I tell you what, you're not short on notes. That's one thing. You uh, <laughs> And you can, choke a, you can choke a note better than any dude I've seen out there, and what a, what a refreshing thing to watch, man! I mean, well, I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. You were playing slide. It was live at some some place, and I think in England, maybe I'm, I may be wrong, but he was play, he, he was playing. I've a, never been. I've never been to England, but I, uh, would okay. it be? I mean, we've been all over the United States and Canada. Um, maybe uh, maybe the guy uh, it gave some credits, and I think maybe one of the guys was from the UK. But it was some band. I don't. It was uh, It was three guys. It was him and, and a bass player and a drummer, and they were live in a in like a nightclub. And, and so it was just a trio. Yeah, and he and it was a fifty eight Les Paul. Okay. And, oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, yeah, and that he, was uh, that was my side band Rufus Huff, and uh, okay, we released one CD back in two thousand nine. It was a uh, uh, Chris Hardesty, by the way, who is now going through a, a cancer scare, which we're trying to get oh, lots huh. of folks to pray to pray for Chris Hardesty, the drummer for Rufus. And uh, it also featured Dean Smith on bass and okay. uh, Garrett England. And I'm pretty sure the clip you're talking about was done in... Uh, there is a slide clip that Andy Ellis did from Guitar Player. Uh, um, it, it was filmed at... Oh, let me get this right. Uh, Third and Lindsley in Nashville. Okay. Now, I did have some credits at the end. I can't, I can't tell you what they say. Yeah, I thought I saw someone like said UK, and I thought maybe they were playing in the UK. Okay, but he does um, a, He does a slide. That's okay, piece. man. That's okay. We we really need to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but was it just basically a slide solo kind of? Well, you did a slide solo, and it, it's like five minutes long, and for about two and a half <laughs> minutes, you did this slide. Then you just pop it off, throw it over to somebody. You can't. They're all frame, mm-hmm. right? And it just proceeds yeah, yeah. to play like I mean, it was like watching Dwayne Allman. Yeah, well, it was, God bless you. Thank it was you. amazing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know what clip you're talking about. That was the third Lindsley, and that was like 2000, maybe seven or eight. That's been that's been a few years ago, but, oh, but uh, that's cool. I, I'm still choking the pitch, you know, like like uh, it, it just it's something we learned from initially. The first time I ever heard that done. Uh, of course, I think Albert King did it, but but I heard Roy Gallagher on Live in Europe, oh, and I was just infatuated with that little sound, you know. And uh, then, of course, Billy Gibbons and, mm-hmm. and Leslie West and people like that. And it's just a part of my vocabulary now. It's just what I do, you know, I guess. And, yeah. yeah, for sure. I'm a, no- I'm a noisy guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> it's such beautiful noise, though, man. It's such beautiful oh, noise. Oh, you should have heard that 58. Oh. Oh well, thank you. It, it actually is down here in the basement with me. It's in a safe place. I, <laughs> that that fifty eight, uh, Joe Bonamassa named it the Hank Plank, and uh, <laughs> I've had the Hank Plank since nineteen ninety. Uh, it was given to me by Hank Williams Jr. Wow, uh, when man. the Headhunters were out there touring with him, and um, it was a funny story. He had bought several guitars because I'm, I'm scattered all over the place here so guys i'm just taking you on a wild goose chase oh but, we love uh, it it is guitar talk <laughs> and uh but but it's weird ed king owned it first ed oh, king wow. Wow. got this 58 les paul in a trade but he already had a nice 59 i think it's the one he's got now he calls red i'm pretty sure and he took the hank plank down to george gruen's in Nashville in the early 80s to sell, and I think they were trying to sell it for five grand, which, you know, back then, five grand in the early 80s, I still couldn't afford it myself, but, I mean, but compared to what they're at now, it's crazy, you know. And um, Hank was getting ready to do a blues album, so he bought the Hank Plank, the 58 Sunburst, he bought a uh, 57 Gold Top, and he bought a Dobro and some other stuff, and, and that guitar, the Hank Plank ended up out on the road, with him, uh, and usually his guitar player, Animal Turner, would play it at night. And I actually, when we were out there touring with Hank at 90 to 92, I would see Animal. Actually, I ended up with it before uh, 92. So, but Animal, initially, I would see him throw it to the guitar tech, like <laughs> long throw at guitar, oh, which made me scared, you know. 
And I finally ended up borrowing it to shoot a video with. And I plugged it into an old Marshall, and I went, zing. I said, "Uh uh-oh. It was like God speaking to me. And somehow, by the grace of God, I ended up with that guitar, and I've had it ever since, um, thanks to Hank Jr. And it's a beautiful guitar. It's just got that buttery sound we love, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 Totally stock. I appreciate appreciate the kind of words about the slide and all that stuff, too. But I had to take you on a little trip there for a second oh, oh nice. no that's good we we, we love, love stories man. <laughs> yeah. we love stories yeah, man. well i got stories man i got <laughs> stories i can even tell so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we want the good ones you can't tell. <laughs> but, but spe- I mean, speaking of stories, man, let's... Never, maybe I'll be part two. I, 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 have to, I have to think I want... I mean, I got some good ones, but... <laughs> so whatever you guys want to ask, man, you know? Uh, I mean, the only drugs we do now is like for high blood pressure and uh, uh, acid reflux and... You know, cholesterol and stuff like that. Oh, that's I mean, beautiful. Popping the, the occasional the ibuprofen, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> but let's let's. I mean, let's take it back a little. I always like to to take our guests back a little and find out where they came from and and what made them put the the six string instrument in their hand. I mean, you know, did you want to impress a girl or whatever? Where where'd you come from and when did you start? I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, March 31st, 1953. I'll be 62 at the end of this month. And I grew up in a musical family. My dad played, not professionally, but he played hillbilly music, uh, country music, Ernest Tubb, Hank Williams. And uh, his brother, younger brother, was like a a singing star around Louisville, Mr. Wade Martin, Hmm. who was a songwriter, hillbilly singer. And he actually, uh, we did his song on Picking on Nashville, High Step and Daddy. And um, then my older brother, Gary, played rock music. And it was always a nice guitar around the house, either a Stratocaster. And then we had a, a, a cousin move up from the country. It lived with us in, from like 63 to 66, and he had an old 335. So there were guitars upstairs along with a pretty cool album collection. Um, had an album collection that consisted of you know the Yardbirds, the Beatles, Lonnie Mac. Uh, there were 45s by Travis Walmack, uh, Adventures. Um, actually, Roy Clark, you know, there was a country <laughs> rock and some blues. And um, so it was just only a natural thing seeing my uncle play and my brother play. And uh, when the Beatles hit in 64, it was just like, okay, mm-hmm. uh, this is a, I, I was really shy in, in, in grade school. So it was a easy way to actually impress a girl, and maybe actually talk to one. But but I think, you know, it was just it was just a thing that that it was a natural progression to pick it up, and pick out tunes on it. I think the first thing I ever learned how to play was what I'd say by Ray Charles. You know the dun 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 oh, yeah. dun, you know that type of thing. Yeah, yeah. And then from there on, you know, you'd learn a little Beatles riff like Day Tripper, and maybe. Um, Oh gosh, ventures like Walk Don't Run, mm-hmm. maybe a Lonnie Mac riff. But, uh, you know, growing up in Louisville, it was a very vibrant river town for that period. We had two local AM stations, WAKY and WKLO, and we had some very good local bands. There was Soul Incorporated, the Rugby, the Oxfords, the Legion Field, uh, gosh, us four, just a lot of good bands. And, and, these bands would get their records played on the radio up there. It's not like it is now, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, these guys were just, as, you know, when the Beatles hit by 65, these guys were playing all over town, and they were like our heroes. Uh, so, like from 64 to 67, I wasn't extremely serious about it, but I was playing, you know. And in the end of 1966, Dad got set up with Louisville, and he moved the whole family back down to Edmonton, Kentucky, which is about 20 miles from where I live now in Glasgow. And my family roots where my dad and mom are from is Midcalf County. So when we moved down there, we're coming out of a, of a small city like Louisville into a, a, a town with a population less than 1,000 people. Wow. And it really, Oh, yeah, yeah. And the population probably hasn't changed a whole lot. It's probably gotten smaller, you know. Wow. Um, 
Uh, it really is crazy. And for a little town like that, it's got. I, when I tell you who all's come from there, it, it'll blow you away. I mean, that's where the Headhunters come from. There's a band called Blackstone Cherry from there, oh, yeah. um, oh. and which is kin folks to us. And right, right. There was I, I know guys those guys well. Do you know who they are, by the way? Oh, yeah, I know them well. We worked with them um, when I was still doing the Buddha thing. We were working with those guys for a while. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. I know Chris and Ben. And Ben, and John yeah. Chris, John. Yeah, well, great, great guys. The, John Fred is Richard's son, ribbon guitarist and the headhunters. So okay. we watched him grow up, man. I mean, little kids just sitting around watching us play, though. You know, so we open up for them now when we do play. With them. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Which is okay. It's all. Right. But you know, the thing is, when we when I moved to Edmonton, and I had been going to Edmonton all my life because my family roots were there. You know, go down on summers and vacations, and it was fun and. You know, going down to see cousins and stuff like that. But when we moved down there, there was nothing to do. We lived out in the middle of nowhere, about, hmm. oh gosh, about seven miles north of town in an old farmhouse. And only thing I had really was, we're in Louisville, you know, it's just a bigger city and you, you had, you could go buy records and, and you know, do different things. Mm-hmm. Down here, there was nothing to do but listen to records what records i had brought with me from louisville and then am radio and at that point when you live in a little place like edmonton the local radio stations would go off at around six o'clock wow and that's the way it was down there and then you'd have to tune into the bsl chicago or wcfl mm-hmm. and, and check out the bigger stations just As get you some... know if you listen to am radio at night yeah you get skip you get skip there you yeah. go uh-huh. so, you, know, you know what skip is and um we could go into amplitude modulation. <laughs> you know, I don't want to bore everybody. But but anyway, at night I would listen to a lot of uh, Chicago radio. And I remember in 67 hearing Jimi Hendrix for the first time and hearing The Doors. And I can remember the very first time hearing uh, Sunshine to Love by Cream and things like that, which really impacted my life. But, it, it seemed, you know, I was very, it, it was nothing going on in Edmonton. And I had an old Stella. So I didn't have the luxury of having my brother's guitars mm-hmm. or my cousin at that point. But my brother came down one weekend and he noticed I was picking out songs on this old Stella. And he knew that uh, I was taking a real interest in it. And I guess he just started noticing that. Um, by the next year, and fast forward to 1968, my, I went back to Louisville one weekend to my brother's wedding. He all of our family moved down except my older brother. He couldn't handle it. He stayed up in Louisville. And, and, uh, Needed the big city. Yeah. He must have had a revelation, and he wanted to go into bluegrass music. Uh, I ended up with his 1955 Gretsch Silverjet, wow. uh, a little magnetone amplifier, and more <laughs> records. And I had seen a band in Louisville the, that weekend in 68 called Elysian Field, which was a three-piece power trio. And it just, I don't know, it was just from that moment on, it was like a light went off. Even though I'd seen The Love and Spoonful in 66 and was really blown away, it was this moment in Louisville in 68. When I saw this three-piece band, I went, that's what I want to do. And that's <laughs> where I went. And about two weeks later, I met Richard and Fred and they had others. That wow. is so wild. But the God moment, they, uh, the, the heavens opened up and Marshall stacks were hurt from above. <laughs> <laughs> No master volume either. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you, you didn't go straight into Marshall Stacks in in the little no. town at that point, did you? I mean, you had, but I mean, geez, um, a, a silver jet and a, and a cool magnetone. I mean, yeah. do you still have them? <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm sad to say. What what happened on the uh, silver jet? My brother had the guitar, and he hated the silver finish so bad that he took black paint and painted it. Uh. Uh, well, it, it, gets, it, it actually has a happy ending. Um, when I got the guitar, it was in shambles. It was in pieces. Um, I brought it back to Edmonton, and we uh, were able to strip the paint off with no no bad problems, you know, mm-hmm. and got got it back to its original color. Uh, it had a Bigsby, which was interesting. And um, best I remember, see, in 55, it would have had the Armin, the D. Armin single coil pickups. And so that was my first guitar. And, of course, I was trying to, 
But the, the magnetone wasn't a very high uh, gain amp at mm-hmm. all, really. It had a great vibrato, yeah, great yeah. vibrato on it. And it, you could get that Lonnie Mac type thing with it, or the Robert Ward thing, but it never quite distorted. So that Christmas, after I got that, I got a box tone bender and a uh, Clyde McCoy box wah-wah for Christmas. Nice. Along with, uh, along with Wheels of Fire, Axis Bold as Love, the Beatles White Album, and Jeff Beck Beckola. So that was good primers <laughs> right there. <you> know? <laughs> That's <laughs> a lot of good company right there, man. That's yeah, man. a lot of good kept, company. Oh, those were great. But I kept dreaming. I, I knew that these Marshalls were a part of the equation, but I never really, honestly, I never, it would it'd be a few years later before I'd even get to plug into a Marshall or even have one. And um, I did learn early on, though, the best sound that you can get is just crank a tube amp up and, and you would get that similar sound, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's basically how I got into it. And that was my first guitar, and I had the Gretsch till I ended up. My brother also at some point gave me a Baldwin Grand Bison uh, 335 looking guitar for a while. Huh. But yeah. I only had that for a few months. I ended up, by the grace of God, my brother worked at a pawn shop in Louisville, and I happened to be up one Thanksgiving visiting around 69 or 70. This gentleman come in who was laid off, and he was going to try to pawn in a mid-50, no, actually it was a 58 Les Paul Special, the two P90s. Wow. So my brother headed him off the pass and got the number, and we went out and did a trade with the Grand Bison and some cash, and I ended up with a, for about Oh, God, for about four or five, and maybe not that long, maybe two or four years, I played a, a, a 58 Les Paul Special. So wow. that was a great guitar, great guitar. Oh, for sure. Which I don't have, I don't have them now, unfortunately. We didn't, back then we thought they were used guitars, right. and we did trading. I, I traded the 58 Les Paul for a, a, a late 50s Esquire, and a bogan pa head <laughs> <laughs> wow and uh, i don't have none of them now i've got the old guitars now but i don't, I don't have any of my old ones old ones you know yeah at that uh, point at that point you know we, we all know they they weren't vintage they were just old you yeah know? they were old <laughs> just traded them guitars, for something right? new right yeah and we were just starting to read uh, uh, articles coming out of england about eric clapton talking about les pauls and i remember the guitarist in the Bee Gees. I can't think of his last name. His name was Vince. He actually had one. And there again, I didn't really hear Peter Green or Mick Taylor a few years later, but I knew mm. that Les Paul, you know, I saw John Sebastian with the Love and Spoonful in 66 play one. And immediately I was infatuated with the look of a burst. I, I thought, I, it, it really did. It hit me. I thought, that is the coolest guitar I've ever seen. Yeah. And then if you fast forward to 68, which was a very magical time, I bought the Super Sessions album of Michael Bloomfield, Al Cooper, and mm-hmm. then I understood what a Les Paul did. You know? <laughs> and then I started going, now I, I know it looks cool, now I know that it sounds cool. So my quest in life from that moment on was to find a Les Paul. And it took me a few years to get the humbucker Les Paul, but I, I did get one. You know? It took a long time. In what year was that one? Well, the, I, of course, I, the first one I saw on was the uh, 58. Right. With P90s. P90s. Yeah. The, the first humbucking Les Paul I got was for graduation in 72, and it was a 1972 Les Paul custom with humbuckers. Oh, okay. Well, there and, you go. <laughs> and but the, the funny thing is, I mean, if, if I'd had the gumption and knew what to do, uh, I could have went out and found a burst. You know, I could have went to Gruen's and got one probably for $1,000, you know, but... I mean, $1,000 to a kid in 1968 or 69, that's a lot of money. That's you know? a car. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of money, man. And um, yeah. so, but it was pretty cool just getting the custom and plugging that boy into a cheap amp and hearing the, the humbuckers actually push the preamp and going, okay, this is it. And then throughout the 70s, I would try to get various, uh, you, know, you know, the funny thing is when Gibson reintroduced the Les Pauls, and as Gruen said, when people started calling him about him, they wanted to know, do you have a La Paul? Do you have a La Paul? La Paul. You know, they didn't call him Les Pauls. Uh, these people from France, do you have a La Paul? 
Gibson, they they gave us in '68 a gold top of P90s, and also a Les Paul Custom. They didn't do the Sunburst Les Paul till a few years later. Mm-hmm. And, and the and the Sunburst is the one that was called in all the ruckus in England. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they stopped making that for quite a while. They did. Uh, yeah. What well, was uh, the last year for the the burst? The, the magic years were what well, for the burst for fifty eight to sixty. Mm-hmm. Then they quit making them. They went into SG style, and then they start re. It's either sixty seven or sixty eight when they reintroduced them. But the humbucker standard, I think, didn't happen till like seventy two to seventy four, something like that. And if you go back and look at the Les Pauls from the seventies, they really weren't very good guitars. They were not very nice. No. You know, three-piece tops, uh, the big headstock. Rubber neck. You know, oh, just terrible stuff, yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking. I, I think that uh, the 70s just weren't good years for Les Pauls or, or Stratocast. Well, if you, know you if you think about it, we were in a recession through the 70s pretty yeah. much. I mean, yeah. they had the gas crunch and... Yeah, you know it was it, it, the seventies yeah. and early eighties. Things were just not right. I remember the gas lines back then. Yeah, and cars looked like boxes. You know, they just <laughs> it was, everything just started really taking on. It was just not good. Harleys were made from a bowling ball company. True, AMF. Yeah, AMF. You know, AMF. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, things were just wrong during those years, you know, except for there was some great music that came out of those days. Mm -hmm. There was some good music that came out. I mean, those were, and y'all can correct me, but I think those were the last really magic years. I mean, for myself, I mean, for guitar rock, I mean, we still had Montrose and a lot of brilliant players. I mean, but and it was always great players any, any decade, but as you know, in the late seventies, uh, the disco craze here after oh, Southern yeah. Rock, mm-hmm. you know. So. Yeah, guitar I mean, wasn't the king anymore. You well, know? You know, except, except for Eddie. Yeah, exactly. And he talked oh, about God. that in his yeah, interview. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. I, I, for, I, I could, I know the moment I heard him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was living with Richard and Fred, listening to WK, um, sorry, KDF, out of Nashville, and I heard Eruption. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I went. What is that? You know, yeah, something that's just changed is that? in the universe, you know. <laughs> Well, you know what you know what's funny is is that when you talk to guitar players, mm-hmm. they recall that day hearing Eddie Van Halen, Van Halen one, like I remember what happened when where I was when the space shuttle blew up, and I remember where I was when right. Kennedy was shot. That goes right. in or that 9/11 list. Or nine eleven or something. Yeah, that it? goes yeah. in that list. Yeah, <laughs> it does. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, if you I go remember, back, if... I was I was laying um, <laughs> I, I, I literally lived with Richard and Fred for about a year. And I had a mattress next to their bed and uh, great, great, great stereo in the room. And I remember listening. We always listened to KDF out of Nashville. And and they played Eruption in the You Really Got Me. Mm-hmm. And and I thought, man, things mm-hmm. have changed. <laughs> you know, you think, you think you're finally getting a handle on stuff, and then you go, mm-hmm. no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you got some guy yeah, that turns hear, a corner like that. You hear that, and you go, yeah, it's just going back in the case. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had no clue what he was doing. Then people started, uh, I go to Louisville, and I see these younger guys go, oh, this is what he's doing. You know, well, okay. I mean, I was still young, too, I guess, back then. But, but uh, I, you know, back then, we didn't have the Internet. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> Barely any TV where we were living. We had like some TV, but radio was the king back then. That's what we had. Sure, so. sure. And you couldn't see it, and you know, half the time in, no. in concert, you know, he wouldn't let you see what he was doing. So it took a while before people actually figured out what the hell was going on with this guy. So. Was he pretty? Was he pretty productive of that technique in the beginning? Yeah, that's 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 what he says. That's what we're told. He, yeah. he was kind of. I I think I think actually David Lee probably told him. He said. Turn around. Don't let them see what you're doing, you know? Yeah, and, and I, I also, in that interview, uh, early on, he didn't want anybody uh, mm-hmm. doing his thing. Oh, no, yeah, and, and sure. And it took his dad and his brother to pull him to the side and say... Okay, maybe it was his brother. Yeah, maybe yeah, it was Alex, yeah. yeah and yeah. they just said, let it go. No, uh, this was year, This was some time after they, after. after they were starting... He was really starting to get his name out there. He was like, you know what? Just, just let it go. You're the guy. Everybody's mm-hmm. going to come after you," he said. "So just just let it go." Yeah. So that's yeah. when it all changed. I mean, he yeah, because at the beginning, yes, he would turn around, he, he, right? And it used to uh, it used to make some of the audience a little angry. 
they thought he was yeah. tricking them with tape. Right, he wasn't uh, actually yeah, playing. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because they, he got you know he got this virtuoso listing. Your know, guitar player went nuts mm-hmm. in '78 oh, yeah. over that, and they uh, you know everybody was saying, well, we don't see him playing it, so we don't think that he's we don't doing it. it. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. they, they mm-hmm. you know the the rumors were that they sped the tape up. During the yeah, recordings, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, that they did all kinds of trickery to make this sound because nobody was doing it. For so, sure. So, you know, and then him go out there and turn his back. It's like a little Milli Vanilli thing going on, you know, in, in the mid, late 70s. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. you know, you know, and I can't remember what year it was. I'm thinking it was 77. There was a tour came through Louisville and maybe Nashville. And I wish I'd been on at this show, but it was Journey. Mm. You know, Sean. Now this is this is when Steve had just joined, and you know they were uh, just gaining their ground and figuring where they were going to go. And of course, they were coming out of the jam band thing into having a, a vocalist like that. Uh, Ronnie Montrose doing Open Fire, wow, and Eddie Van Halen, those mm. three. Can you imagine? That's that's a ticket. Mm. That's a ticket. That must have been at least ten dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much it was in Louisville? Yeah, a dollar two. Holy I'll get out of here. A the, the station two. was WLR, uh, WLRS, WLRS, uh-huh. and they were one hundred two. See, let me think. One hundred two point three. Uh, so it was, it was, it was a the, station the, promotion the, yeah. show. Wow. Yeah, one. It was a dollar <laughs> two, and I. They actually had Johnny Winter. They always had a great show. Uh, they would give their listening audiences a, a, a show or two a year. But I didn't make that one. I don't know where I was. I was probably working or something like that. Mm. But I have a friend who's a really good guitar player out of Louisville, Paul McGarry. He was there that night, and he said he he was walking in the back next to the soundboard, and he saw Neil Sean watching Eddie Van Halen from, from the soundboard. Mm. He, I went up to Neil and talked to him, and, and finally Neil said, well, excuse me, I want to watch him. <laughs> wow. Know? <laughs> step off i got a lesson uh, here <laughs> yes uh, oh yeah and, and uh, but you know there again ronnie montrose on the show ronnie is like was we became friends unfortunately passed on mm-hmm. three years ago but he was one of my huge heroes back from the well i always i didn't realize he was part of the, the edgar winter band uh you know Early, you know, you don't, I don't know, they only come out at night. I, I probably knew he was in there. He, didn't, he played some great stuff. Mm-hmm. But when that first Montrose album came out, I just, I went, oh, God, that's it. That's it for me. That's like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. It's a different type. It, it, you know, Led Zeppelin's deep. We know the writing is deeper and everything. But, but the Montrose thing was, God, it was great. Yeah. God, I loved yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, he was a fantastic player. Yeah. I, I enjoyed oh, him. Yep. Oh, soulful and... and fluid and mm-hmm. had tone yeah and, here, here. and i would pick his brain every chance i could and just to know that he played a 310 bandmaster on the first montrose album and i always thought <laughs> oh wow i thought packs of monster yeah it was a 310 tweed <laughs> bandmaster that's what that was but wow now, a tweed nice now now you want to hear something that's uh that's unique about ronnie in his later years that's right they didn't do a 310 and a blonde i'm sorry i'm thinking out loud that's okay in his later years uh he moved over to pierce amplifiers Mm -hmm. and which were no tubes at all yeah yeah Yeah, pierce Pierce and he was he was like their big endorser for a long time he was used to to see him in the guitar magazines (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and, if you, and then think about this. A, uh, somewhere around 77 or 78 during Open Fire, he was also endorsing Lab, the Lab Series amps. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we we uh, we had a big discussion about those one day. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> with, um, was it with Dean or Joe? Or it was with somebody. Uh, uh, Dean Farley. Dean Farley. It might have been Dean, yes. yeah. And, um, yeah, that was um, uh, Ty, right? Ty Tabor. Ty, yeah, Ty, yeah, he was a big uh, player. Tabor. He's a great sound, by the way, yeah. 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 He was a big player of Lab. Yeah. But, well, yeah. let me ask you this: What do those amps sound like? I've never, I've never really plugged into one. Can, was Ron? I mean, do they sound pretty good? I mean, evidently these guys were getting good sounds out of them. Uh, which ones? The Lab Series the or lab Pierce? Series. Oh, lab, lab Series. series. Yeah. yeah. I, uh-huh. I had the fortunate uh, to play like uh, a two twelve uh, combo version. Okay. This guy yeah. I went to school with. He like bought the L one hundred or something. Yeah, like something that. like yeah, that. Yeah. I just remember I was like, "That's louder than a Marshall stack," <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. I mean, it was. 
it was it hurt it was so loud but it produced yeah. this thing of distortion that was so unique it oh, didn't sound yeah. like it didn't sound like a pedal it didn't have that harshness it was actually very it was it was darker yeah, it, you know? it, it didn't break up like a well, lot. It didn't break up like a nasty like solid state B. B. output distortion. BB King, right? BB King used to use them all too. But he, I mean, he's he's Mr. Clean. You know, yeah, but. yeah. But he, you know, that 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 sweet mm -hmm. thing that he does with that Lucille guitar, it, right? That that amp is doing that. You yeah. know, that that, that it's oh. they were just that way. Yeah, it was you know? it was very different than any other solid state amp that I remember. Yeah, it was it was like you could go. You looked at it and you went, yeah, I could totally use this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? I was curious because, I mean, when the open fire came out, there was Cal Without Pity, which is really, really oh, great. Oh, God, I love that. So I love this version. <laughs> oh, God, yeah, absolutely. Just just phenomenal. And the tone is phenomenal. And I don't have, of course, I don't have the luxury of, I used to, could ask Ronnie anything whenever we were on the phone. And he would, he would tell me, you know, but I, we never really had that discussion if he was actually using those lab series amps. Because uh, I was just so inquisitive about the early Montrose years, but um, those labs, I know they're used in Nashville by Rick, they were used by Ricky Skaggs and a guy by the name of Ray Flack, but it was more mm -hmm. of a country thing. And uh, so the labs must be very usable in their own way, you know. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, yeah. they're, 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 I think they're a secret weapon of a few guys, you mm -hmm. know. I, yeah. I, I think Ty might have moved on, but they were his sound for quite a long time. Yeah, Ty's you know? issue was is that uh, they would get hot and they blow the fets. The and stage, yeah. yeah and uh, he said that they, i remember one time i read in one of the magazines they had swiss cheese the case so much that it literally was going to fall on itself and they had like all these fans that would blow across the thing trying to keep them cool <laughs> and he would still pop them and and eventually he just ran out like mm -hmm. he could not couldn't get anymore he couldn't get them anymore yeah. and i guess they didn't make the fets Oh, that right. certain, probably. Yeah, yeah, you know, he was yeah. very secretive about that for a while too. Right? Oh yeah, yeah, they had it hidden, yeah. and you couldn't go backstage. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What a great band, by the way, King's X. Oh, those yeah. guys, yeah. Are, I've seen them twice, and uh, and I've got a lot of their records. So they're, they're just phenomenal. I love what they do. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. He was uh, he was he was trying out the Buddha thing for a while, but it 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 wasn't close enough to the sound that he was used to mm -hmm. all those years you know it just kind of didn't fit that you know so we never got him as an endorser but you know it was a very dark kind of sound now mm -hmm. you guys work with buddha still now or somebody still work with buddha i don't i mean that was uh, uh myself and scott sears mm -hmm. started buddha back in 95 oh, oh okay because I think Chris Robertson with Blackstone Cherry is using a Buddha and loves it. But, or did. I, he may be using something now different, but he used a Buddha for a while. Yeah, he did. We worked with those guys for a while. I know Ben was still yeah. playing uh, like 5150s or 6505s or something. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. now the um, now the company in Meridian, Mississippi produces the Buddha. So he's pr he might be using one mm -hmm. of their models. And, you know. Gotcha. It's and, not the, and, and Ben is probably using the the higher gain stuff, which he always has. And it's not the yep. same Buddha. Yeah, well, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't go there. But that um, that that first Montrose thing was a, a three ten tweed yeah. bandmaster. Huh? Yeah. That's real. I had never oh, yeah, heard that was, before. Uh, that was one of the first things I asked Ronnie Montrose because that album changed my life. And I first I was coming home from I came home from work one night. I was working at a printing company in seventy three, and WLRS, the station that had the 102 concerts, uh, they would have an album. As, as stations did, they would play an album every night. And I turned the radio on, and I hear Rock Candy kick off. Mm -hmm. And, man, it changed my life. I listened to the rest of that album at night, and I, I went out the next day and bought a copy of it. And I didn't know for years what he was doing, because he really never, if you go back and, and read Guitar Player, interviews from that era i don't think he ever really disclosed he was using the 310 bandmaster he told me later that he had just bought that bandmaster a few days before they did the album at a yard sale and it had some type of mm -hmm. adhesive of paper over it like some type of fake looking wood grain or something and when he peeled <laughs> it back he said the amp was just perfect just perfect wow. and wow. As a matter of fact if you look at some old montrose clips uh, you'll see a Marshall, and you'll see, you'll see that Bandmaster. Cool, cool. <laughs> That's like you know, a, a, 
you know, what a sacrilege, but a lot of guys back in the day that had tweet stuff painted it black. Uh, same, same thing with the, uh, with the blonde fenders, you know, they would tweed and then yeah. blonde and then black. And by the time the black came out, everybody said, Oh, I want a black amp. So they just got out the freaking paint and wow. painted these tweeds and these blondes black. And it's like, you see them nowadays and they go, Oh my God. You know, they used, I mean, 10, 15, 20 years ago, they used to pop up all the time. It's like, you know, what a sacrilege, you know, but who knew again, back then it was just old. We oh, wanted yeah. it to make it look new. You yeah, know? man. Oh God! Yeah, it was. It was a different world. I, I, yeah. I mean, I've done so many crazy things to, uh, to, uh, to amps back then, and even I, I took one Les Paul Junior, uh, a '50s Junior, like a '50, I think it was a '54 or five. And I ended up in the trade, and I put a DiMarzio in it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which was, <laughs> which was crazy. I should have never done that. You know, it was terrible. Of course, it sounded like a. I, I was probably the first guy in Louisville to actually have the Marzio pickups when they first come out. Wow. And I bought them right from the Marzio. It was a little ad in the back of Guitar Player magazine. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, super distortion pickups. This has got to be cool. Yeah. So I ordered them direct from Larry. <laughs> and this is the funny thing. When when they came, there was business cards in there. And on the back of one of the business cards was Rick Geringer's number. And, and I know it was a mistake. So one day I thought, oh, I'm going to call Rick Derringer. So Liz answers, and of course I got, I got real quiet when, when she answered, uh, is Rick there? And she said, who's this? So well, I just said, uh, my name is Greg. I'm in Louisville. I want to ask him a question about DiMarzio pickups, if he used them. So well, if he says he used them, he does. Click. <laughs> that was the end of that. And, uh, and I must have... I think I sent the card back to him. I never did call back. I, 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 I mean, I, and I've got to know uh, uh, Rick, at, you know, the last few years. Not, we laugh about that when we talk, you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, That's amazing. hilarious. Well, you know what? Enough about what all these guys did and used. Let, let's get into <laughs> some, of, some of your gear. I mean, when, when did you get your first Marshall, man? <clears throat> got my first Marshall in 1973. Took a while. You know, um, I, I knew that's what the sound was. Mm -hmm. But in the spring of 73, uh, there was a little rag in Louisville called Bargain Mart, <clears throat> which, you know, because we had no internet back then. You'd get a little Bargain Mart paper every week when it came out. There was a little 50 watt Marshall for sale on the other side of town in Louisville. And immediately I called about it and um, went and borrowed, I think. Three hundred fifty dollars for my dad, <laughs> and uh, went over to this, this place in East End of Louisville, and uh, I bought the Marshall. Yeah, was and, uh, was this something new, or was it one of the older ones with the plastic it was an, face? Oh, it was, it was, oh no, 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 no! Check it, seventy three. I can tell you exactly what it was. I don't have it. Like I don't have anything, but I can tell you what it was exactly. It was a it was a plexi fifty watt head. Mm -hmm. Wow. At Plexi Front. Oh yeah, it, it was the holy grail of the fifty watts. Yeah, wow. um, it was a J, it was a JMP. Uh, mm -hmm. Would it be a Super Fifty? Well, which one would that be? A JMP Fifty or what? Yeah, a JMP Fifty, probably uh, sixty-eight or sixty-nine. I would think latest, right? Sixty-eight or sixty-nine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I bought it. Didn't plug it in or nothing. Uh, when I was walking out the door, another guy was knocking on the door wanting to buy it, and he got really mad. He even tried to buy it from me and give me more money, and I wouldn't do it. And, um, and I've since become, uh, since that day, the funny thing is the guy selling it that day was sick, but he had another friend there selling it for him, and uh, I've become friends with the guy who sold it to me. He, he sent me a picture of that Marshall here the other day, you know, him wow. using it way back in the day. So. I had that Marshall, honestly, back, you got to understand, when I, when I plugged into it, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. But I didn't have a Marshall cabinet. I was, like, mismatching. I was probably going into a Fender cabinet, going from 16 ohms, didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I would blow the head up every other week, blow it up every other week. <laughs> so I finally traded it off, you know, which was a mistake, a terrible mistake. I should have kept it. Mm -hmm. um, I have since picked up a couple other Plexi 50-watt heads, but, you know. You yeah, think the, back to those ones you had. The you first one watch. is the first one, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was beautiful. I mean, it was. It was a great. It was a great moment. And after that, you know, 
I think I, I went through a, a succession of different things, you know, like a, some reason super reverbs. I found a lot of those in Louisville, and really a super reverb, uh, like a blackface super, mm-hmm. 65, 66, uh, they, they really sound great cranked up. They, they, they don't sound like a Marshall, but they have a great sound. Um, so definitely I, I definitely one of my favorite things. amps, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I use those a lot. And I think I even had some twin reverbs, which were, you know, extremely loud. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, even had, I even had a super twin. You know, the, you remember those things? Oh, that yeah. Are like a, yeah. A 150 watts or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I just went through a different, during the 70s, you know, I went, I was trying pedals after pedals. I was trying everything just to figure out, you know, I, I should have went back to getting a Marshall, but I didn't do that. Uh, it took me till like 19... 19- 77 to buy a 100 watt Marshall from a, a guy in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Uh, it was a 100 watt, 75, 1975 100 watt. And I still got that. I got rid of it, and then when it came up for sale again, I went and grabbed it back. <laughs> nice. I went and grabbed it back. I've got it. it you know, I still got it. And, uh, but man, I went, I went through all kind of heads. And, and I mean, I've got a lot of old Marshalls now. I mean, I've got a, a 67. Uh, Super Lead 100. I've got a 68 Super Lead 100. I've got two 69 Metal Front 100s, uh, 70 Super Bass. Uh, you know, and I've got two or three other 100 watts. I've got uh, two Plexi 50 waters that I, mm. I I made a mistake of getting rid of one of them. And when it came up for sale again, I went and grabbed it back. Like, you know, I've learned my lesson on that stuff now. Yeah, I got rid of a small and, top 50 years ago that I shouldn't have. Uh. I've got to, I've got about four or five of those little small tops, and they're they're amazing. They're amazing little super weapons, you know, mm-hmm. the secret weapons. And, and, and the '69 uh, metal panel will take your face off. <laughs> that's right, that's right, <laughs> man. They will. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I've got I've got a '69. When I bought this, I tell you what, I, I did get the one in '77, and and during the '80s, it was another one of those uh, desert times you know where you're out there wandering around going you know i bought a mesa boogie which i never could get it to work right and i went through some different things and it, when I, I bought a 6900 water uh in louisville in 1988 and that thing right there is the most it's, it's my favorite head i own really it's a metal front uh, 69 which is the same thing as a 68 plexi i would think really. yeah pretty much I mean, yeah. And the best I can tell, this Marshall 69 is the first one to ever be shipped into Louisville because a band called Legion Field had it. And um, it's, it's great. Matter of fact, it's, it's out in the garage here. I, I, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a 412 in a garage and about three heads stacked on top of each other, and I'll, I'll play in the other room. I'll, I'll run a chord in here in the living room, and it's got this natural echo out in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so I have fun, That's cool. have, have fun that way. So I mean, I don't know, guys. I mean, I've got all. I'm a, I'm a Marshall guy, although I do have some fenders and things like that. You know. Yeah, but you're you're definitely a Marshall guy. Well, you, know, you can't go wrong. He's got the Gibson into the Marshall. Right, right. That's but but equally as familiar it. with the Strat. You know, I've seen him. Yeah. Oh, I, I have a question for you. And some people may not know you do this, and maybe we can turn him on to it. But you do this little thing every once in a while called Licks from the Outhouse. Licks from the Outhouse, yeah. <laughs> and and is, I mean, is that one of the Marshalls that you're talking about mm-hmm. that yeah, is pretty absolutely. much your go-to? Most, mm-hmm, most generally, uh, if I'm sitting on the stair, if I'm in the kitchen, I'm using a little tweed champ amp or if i'm on the road hmm. i'll usually take the cheap the, uh, it's not cheap i'm saying a little little champ amp tweed champ amp on the road i'll take it and put it in the bathroom where you get that natural echo you know and you get <laughs> nice. the, i call it that little extra talent you know <laughs> you never get at things, one at reverb is like can you turn the talent up <laughs> you know <laughs> and and uh but but uh here when you when i'm sitting in the stairwell at here at the house doing licks from the house I'm usually playing in that 6900 watt in the mm-hmm. 1412. Now the the 6900 watt's got two tubes pulled, and I would run the ohms back because oh, nice. 100 watts it would it would be breaking windows and all kind of crazy things here, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of air. It yeah. is. It, it moves you know, a lot of air. <laughs> but that's uh, but that, that that's my main. I've got I think right now stacked out there is a uh, 
Let me think here. There's a uh, uh, 1970 Super Bass, the 69, 100 Water, and I believe one of the Plexis is out there. Either 68, 68 Plexis out there too. Yeah. Mm. That's cool, man. Got three of those on, you could heat the garage, you know? Yeah, exactly. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, this garage is a mess. This whole basement's a mess. You guys would have fun here, though. There's all kind of stuff down here. For sure, <laughs> man. Um, favorite guitar? I'm assuming it's got to be a Les Paul, and you probably own more than one. Yeah, my favorite my favorite guitar that I own is the 58 Les Paul that I got from Hank Jr. Mm -hmm. The Hank Plank. The 58 Plank. Sunburst. Yeah, the Hank Plank. And um, I've had it since 1990, and um, I don't take it on the road as much. I use it with other, you know, like like I'm playing a side project around home. On the road with the headhunters, it just gets a little iffy because you're playing. One day you might be playing a, a festival, you might be playing a Harley deal, or you might be playing a club. So it's yeah. just kind of crazy. Uh, I know bonamassa has got five of them now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Last time I was out seeing him, him, you know, he's like, check this one out. I just got this one. He hands me another 59. You know, pretty pretty like, soon you're going to have to go to him to actually buy, to buy a 59. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Brother Joe. I know. No, I love Joe. He's, he's very, very, very uh, passionate about what he does. And yeah. Um, matter of fact, I, I'd never I mean, known who Joe was for a number of years, but. When he was younger, but I had a side band called Rufus Huff, and we opened up for him oh, nice. in 2007 and two, in Louisville and Nashville, and we become real good friends. This was before he had had a had a Sunburst Les Paul. He was using just a uh, just using a reissue at that point. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, he 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 would see me playing Hank, and I think he really it may have hope hopefully inspired him. I, I hope you know in a way. Um, <laughs> But my favorite Les Paul is that one. Uh, my next favorite guitar would be the '57 Strat. No, God. Nice. Um, then I've got some other guitars. I got two '50 Juniors. And, uh, got another '57 Strat. That's not quite as cool as the one, but it's pretty neat. I've got a '59 Tele. I've mm. got a. Oh God, let me think here. Mm, well, I don't, I don't have as many as I used to. I used to have some old 335s and all kind of other stuff. But then I've got, you know, you know, Gibson did a, a, a collector's choice version of my 58 Les Paul. Oh, wow. It's the collector's choice number 15. And I've got the prototype. That guitar is pretty amazing, actually. Really, they did a good job on that. And nice. I've also got a John Sebastian, the Love and Spoonful Burst, the collector's choice number 13. <laughs> And uh, that's a nice guitar. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know they did that one. That's very nice. I didn't know they did yours either. That's excellent, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's yeah, great. yeah. Man, go go look at the Gibson Custom Shop. Just just uh, look up uh, Gibson Collector Choice number 15. That's my Les Paul. Wow. Yeah. Very nice, yeah. very nice. Well, we'll have mm -hmm. to... Uh, they got Ronnie Montrose, too, by the way. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can get any famous guitar player's guitar that you want, you know. That's I mean that's pretty amazing because they're really doing a good job of that nowadays. We oh, were just yeah. discussing yeah. um the strats off, off air the strats and and I was I was talking about a um a rig rundown that I had seen of of Ingve when he was he was just describing his new signature strat which yes. had just come out and it was probably the fifth iteration of it already. Mm -hmm. And he says, "Oh, this one finally has the big headstock." So, like, they were putting out Ingve strats for, for years with, with his name headstock. on it with a small headstock. And, you know, they really, nobody was paying attention to detail like they do nowadays. Yeah, now they can make it like the one he's playing. I mean, down to the last mark. Yeah. yeah. Eddie, Van Han finish. Eddie Van Halen's uh, Frankenstein strat was done by Fender. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. Right. Because his whole EVH line comes out of Fender. Right. right. And oh, uh, okay. th they, did yeah. it, they did such a perfect job. That he actually had to write on the back of the original one. This is the original guitar. Mm -hmm. No, I mean they're so dead nuts close nowadays. It's, it's crazy. Wow. Yeah, wow. down to the cigarette wow. burn. So I'm I'm sure they did a hell of a job on number fifteen. Yeah, you know, I, I shit, I'd love to play one one of these Absolutely. days. Just see what it's like. And then they they did they did a great job. Uh, now the funny thing is, guys, though, my guitar is really a plain top. I mean, if you look at pictures, though, they're very nothing wrong with that. No. Yeah, I'm, there's there's a very hate, uh just a little bit of flame in one spot, but it's really a plain top. 
it's faded into a, a lemon burst. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of people think it's a gold top when they see me playing it live, but it's really just a, a yellow lemon burst. Uh, I have seen some of the CC-15s. One came through Dave's guitars up in Wisconsin one day. It was the flamiest thing I've seen in my life, and I thought, that's not like my guitars. I tried to get it. I said, man, hey, is it? Uh, how's it get? It's well, we already sold it. <laughs> I, I thought, oh, one of my guitars were playing. <laughs> See, you know, it's, and so many people buy guitars just by picture nowadays because it's yeah, got it's got yeah. the most beautiful flame top. And if you know, if you're buying it to hang it on the wall, and look at the flame top, great. Mm. But how do you know what the guitar is really like? Exactly. You know? That's why I mean, you got to be so careful about that, man. I, this John Sebastian, I bought. I lucked out on that. Um. Because I had the guy to play it, and I and I trusted the guy. Because I normally don't buy guitars like that. Mm -hmm. um, and he said it had extra sustain. He was right. It had a it had a nice top on it. See, I I don't I don't have to have a flamed out top. But the only thing that bugs me about some of these guitars they put together, it looks like they slap two pieces of wood together. It'll be flamed from one on one side, and another one you go that ain't right. It ain't right. I don't yeah, you know. It ain't a book match. No. <laughs> It needs to be book mass, at least, man. Yeah. Don't take, you know. Um, but I did. I got this John Sebastian. Actually, it's a good guitar. And uh, Gibson's cool. making some really, really nice guitars. I believe they're doing it. And I, I assume that Fender is, too, I, oh, I would yeah. think. The yeah. custom shops on both of those places are pretty yeah, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I yeah, mean, it's at, amazing time, man. Yeah. As, as, and it is, it's, it's, everything has changed a lot. And, you know, we could, we could probably take another hour discussing <laughs> how things have changed there. And I would love to, but we'll have we, to have we, them we, on again. Yeah, we got to, yeah, well, you know, yes, we'll focus on like instruments and things like that next time. You know, oh we, got, we, got, gosh, we got the backstory. Are we done about running out of time now? Yeah, yeah, yeah I think we're running a little <laughs> bit short, but, um, you know, uh, hopefully we can see that guitar and some other guitars out at some point in time. Are you guys, you guys got any plans for touring in the summer? Or, oh, or? yeah. Good. Yeah. No, yeah. there you go. Good. Well, let's see. The Headhunters, we have done about three or four dates this year. But our next date is actually close to home, uh, March 28th at Hot Rod Stadium in Bowling Green. We open up for ZZ Top, actually. Oh, very nice. Brother Billy. Gibbons, one of my buddies, and then uh, Blackstone Cherry's on the show, too, so it's going to be like a, a family show. Wow. And then from there, uh, we have other shows coming up. You can go to uh, KentuckyHeadhunters.com and, and check out our schedule on Facebook. We'll have the link and, up. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely oh, yeah, put the link Yeah, please link us up, and uh, we're just kind of setting the touring right now. We have a uh, new CD dropping in May on Alligator Records out of Chicago. It was actually done with the late, great Johnny Johnson, the piano player with Chuck Berry. Nice. And we did one with Johnny back in 93 or 4. And then we actually got him back in the studio about two years before he passed, and we did another CD project. We're just now just now getting it together and, and putting it out, finally. So we'll be on the road this, this, this year touring. Awesome. Just doing what we do, man. Playing Good, man. music. Absolutely. Well, if you're anywhere near the uh, the Northeast, we'll uh, we'll look you up. We'll have to come out and say, hey. Yeah. Just love to check we'll, out the show. Absolutely. I, I don't know the last time we were in Baltimore. Um, there's so many stories. I was there with Leonard Skinner a few years ago, subbing for Ed King. Oh. That's been a long time ago. So, but uh, I've, I've been a lot. I spent a lot of time in Baltimore over the years. You know, so it's cool. uh, always fun. And I used to kid Ed King uh, about. Uh, the, Strawberry Alarm Clock had a song called uh, Barefoot in Baltimore, you know, and I was always kidding about it. He <laughs> threatened to kill me and all that stuff. But there we go. <laughs> Very nice. Hey, it's a great town, man. Great little town. Up it there. is, and it, it really does keep getting better. It really yeah, it does. does keep getting better. So yeah. maybe, uh, you know, if you're at this way, maybe we can hook up, have a beer, grab dinner or something. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. You know, we'll, well, I, I got your number. I'll give you uh, mine, and uh, when you come out this way, we'll hook up, man. We'll have some fun. Yeah. Absolutely, and we can do part two next time. Y'all just specifically ask me about guitars, and we can go from there. I'll try not to lead you guys on wild goose chases. No, 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 man. Uh, it's all, all good. It's all about. I always tell everybody, it's all about the stories, man. It's everybody has them and loves them, so it's yes, all about sir. the stories. Love the stories. That's you know, it. Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate thank you having me on, Greg. Thank you so much for for being on with us, and um, you know, have a great rest of the day. Uh, come on, summer, so we can see you guys on tour, and uh, we'll talk again soon, man. You got it. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, Greg. Take care. You too. Well, and there you have the story. And what a story that was. And we got to we got to have him back on. Yeah, you know, for sure. You know, like okay. like um, probably when the new uh, 
new release comes out. When the yeah. new release hits and yeah. they start touring, we'll have him back on. We'll talk about the new release. We'll talk about some specific guitars and amps and stuff. Yes. And maybe what he's... We never got a chance to talk about what he goes out with. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, do you bring the real, you mm -hmm. know, the real old babies out or, uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. or is he doing fractal? You know, is <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's happening. <laughs> I don't think so either. But one last thing here, and I got to say this because I, I neglect to say at the beginning, uh, happy birthday, my brother. Oh, well, thank you. Yes. Thank and, you. It's uh, it's just, you know, it, honestly, dude, and I, I don't <laughs> say this lightly, it's just another day in paradise. I know that, but, you it's know. It's just another day. In, you didn't let me finish. It's just I, another day in paradise. Exactly. Because every day, every day I wake up and my eyes open, I go, um, it's it's the I'm I'm still here. Yeah. It's a good one. And when I wake up on Wednesday, I go, well, today's not going to suck at all. <laughs> and, it's not, and we got to do one more thing. Yes. Oh, quick yes. lick. Yes, with Mr. Jason Sedidis. Yes. He is a machine. He is. Uh, he, we came up with a new slogan today, which we can't really disclose to anybody, but I'm going to throw that out there because it's an inside joke. It is an inside joke. He'll laugh about it. He will. He and, will. Uh, and and thank you, Jason. Yeah. Oh, wonderful job once again. Go give your hand the workout that it needs. That's right. That's right. Yes. One of these days, I'm going to dare try one of these. I am. I am. <laughs> well, I, to... I think I need to be 10 years younger. But, you know, <laughs> I'm going to try like hell, man. I'm going to try like hell. Yes. So, uh, but So, but... until next time, my friend. And hopefully there will be many, many more. I am, am Mick, Mick Marcelino. Marcelino. Yes. <laughs> and you. That just leaves me to be Jeff Bober. Happy birthday. Thank you. And we are saying. Onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter, at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook. For news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening.